Hey there, my name is Hannah Bauer and I'm the Native American Affairs Program Assistant at the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, a state agency which shares research and resources to help advance the socioeconomic success of minority communities in South Carolina. For today's podcast episode, I interviewed Dr. Jonathan Leader about repatriation. What is it? Where is it? And how does it affect Native American communities in South Carolina? Think of this as Repatriation 101, your crash course in all things repatriation. So I'm Jonathan Leader, and I am the uh, South Carolina State Archaeologist, and I am within the research professor track here at the University of South Carolina Department of Anthropology, and I teach classes both in anthropology, religious studies, art, a few other places as well. So uh, I do both uh, research, run the office as a state archaeologist, and I teach. So yes. you're you're the guy you're the guy to talk to about archaeology in South Carolina. Well, there are lots of people to talk to about archaeology in South Carolina. But that's that's the good news actually is that I have a lots. There are lots of colleagues who are really very good at what they do in terms of archaeology, both generally and for specific uh, questions or interests. So as far as I'm concerned, it, it could not be better. What does the word repatriation mean? And what does it mean in the context of indigenous peoples in America and around the world? Well, first, let's be clear. Uh, I'm not a member of the Native American community as such. I am not a Native American Indian. So the understanding that I have from uh, my professional work is that when you're talking about repatriation, you're talking about, uh, in in a very real sense, making whole. You're returning uh, materials, ancestors, back to a community from which they were bereft. Uh, and you are trying to make whole the damages, uh, ameliorate the scars that that type of behavior that was done in the past produced. So the Native American Great Protection Repatriation Act, Public Law 101, which was passed back in the very early 90s, attempted to deal with a situation that most of us have been aware of all of our professional lives. My first involvement and concern about the uh, about the, this issue goes back to the to the 1970s uh, when I was an undergrad. Actually, before I became an undergrad, when I was still in high school. It was something that was being hotly discussed, both within the community which was directly related to it, which of course are the indigenous people of North America, but also the uh, within the professional community of archaeologists, historians, and others. Uh, whether and who had stewardship or whatever was going on and what did it really mean and was there a consensus that could be reached and uh, how does one move forward on these issues? The law then became a touchstone as to a consensus uh, which made some people happier, but I don't think it made anybody specifically happy in any particular area. Some people you know, gave up something. So it's, uh, it's like anything else when it's made sausage. <laughs> um, it's both good, bad, and indifferent, uh, depending where you stand at any particular topic and which community uh, you might belong to. Now, as state archaeologists, as with every state archaeologist, we have concerns uh, to make sure that it's uh, you know, applied, uh, that uh, it's done in a, an appropriate fashion, and that all the stakeholders um, are involved. I've always taken it uh, to mean that I'm a steward. Uh, I am, you know, there to protect. I am there to make sure that uh, the dignity is maintained, uh, that the integrity of the uh, individuals who have ended up in our holding one way or another are protected. And honestly, that's something which we decided back in, geez, 89, before the law was even passed. It didn't matter which community it came from. It uh, didn't matter time period. Everybody deserved uh, due dignity, respect, and protection. And that also meant that uh, the concept of people simply coming in for research purposes and doing whatever they wanted with uh, human remains was not acceptable without input from uh, stakeholders and other people who were involved. So that's been going on here since 1989. And it's the official opinion and policy of my office that when burials are found, they need to stay where they are. There's a reason people are buried where they're buried. Now, that's not always possible. You have erosion issues, you have road building issues, or other things over there that make that physically impossible. In those instances, we you know push as much as we can for people to bury at least 
in a similar location close to where they were buried. So not infrequently in the past, we've had issues with uh, development, people putting in tract housing. Uh, they find a cemetery and it could be anybody's cemetery or burials. We, we push for green spacing, you know, protect them, put up a fence, uh, historical marker, talk to the communities, find out whose they were and, uh, you know, deal with it responsibly. And again, with mutual dignity and respect. We do not ask that the remains be brought here to be put on our shelves. Uh, that's not helpful as far as we're concerned. And yet if that happens. Totally. It has happened in the past. It has not right. happened recently. Okay. Because we have pushed very hard for that not to happen. Now, we have in time from time in concert with various groups taken things on to protect them with the understanding that this was a request. It's uh, somebody has an issue that needs to be dealt with, the community has been consulted with, which by the way is required by DHEC. Uh, okay. If there's a uh, exhumation, transportation, rehumation of human remains, there has to be permitting through DHEC and that requires 30 days notice and meetings and the rest. So if something like that is going on and there is a temporary stewardship issue, depending on what it is and what the issues are, and if we are asked and it's appropriate, uh, we might indeed agree to that. But that's a lot of if. Uh, that's not a done deal. That is not, that's not smooth. So I think I more or less answered your question, sort of. Uh, this is <laughs> no. Of course, after, after that answer, I have even more questions. Good, um, you should. So, that's, that's how I wake up every morning. There's more questions. <laughs> more questions. It's a good oh. way. It's a good way to move through the world. I agree. Um, can you give like a hypothetical example of when someone would ask you to protect remains? Sure. Like what yeah, scenario sure, sure. would leave, lead someone to ask you to protect the okay. remains? Rather I'll than give you a scenario. Um, let's make one, I'll, make, I'll give you one that's commercial. And then I'll give you one that's uh, that's uh, private. Okay. So the commercial one might be a borrow pit. There's a group out there uh, picking up gravel for whatever. And as they expand their gravel pit, all of a sudden they're going, oh my, we have a femur. So obviously the first thing they're going to do is call the coroner's office and the police to make sure it's not a modern femur or somebody you know who's unfortunately been done away with. Uh, but once they've gotten through that, uh, they call us. We always suggest strongly, have you been in contact with the people at the local church? Have you been in contact with the people in the local funeral homes who keep books as to where people were buried and what properties, et cetera, et cetera? Have you checked with the coroner's office? Uh, have you checked with uh, you know, death, death registries? Have you, what have you done to determine the property and what else is going on there? And in those instances where that's possible, there may be a discussion then between as an elder of a church uh, in charge of burials who says, yes, that was our original burial plat. Uh, we moved to this other location. We do keep track of it. We've been concerned. Uh, and then the corporation goes, oops. And then there's a conversation about what to do. And they may say, for instance, well, we're not really quite prepared yet for a place for them. Uh, but clearly they need to be moved and made safe. And then again, following you know, the permitting process, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they may hire a cultural resource management firm or you know, funeral director group or whatever. Funeral directors tend to do their own storage, cultural resource management groups sometimes have their own storage. Sometimes they call us. And in those instances, we then have a conversation about, okay, so how many boxes, how many people, what's the documentation, where's the explicit statement, and when's the end point? When does everybody go home? Uh, another one, which would be hypothetical on the private side, uh, would be a person, say, in the low country, uh, putting in a swimming pool, which I wouldn't suggest in the low country. Because <laughs> 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 the water level so high, you probably wouldn't have to fill it. But people do put in swimming pools, especially as people move into areas that were traditionally marginalized. And they put in a swimming pool and go, oh my, uh, in the wall, we're seeing caskets. Now what? Mm. Again, coroner, police department, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually they may get to us. And when they do, we come down, we take a look at it. We have the conversation. We try it again to find out to whom do they belong. Uh, you know, talk to local communities. A consensus may be reached between the primaries. We are not a primary. We would be in support. 
And when that's done, if they come back to us and say, again, could you please hold on to these individuals for us for a short period of time while we're doing whatever, the answer would probably be yes. Uh, simply again, to do guarantee dignity and respect, but only if there wasn't a place locally attached to any of those offices and groups uh, that couldn't handle it. So those are two hypotheticals, lots of ifs, and the primary statement is people stay where they're buried. And if they can't stay precisely where they're buried, they need to be as close as possible. Mm. And if they have to be moved someplace else, you follow the regulations of the state. And then you find an appropriate place for them to be buried, which is not simply dumped into a hole someplace in somebody's, you know, back 40 somewhere, somewhere. Right, like somewhere totally random. So in development projects, are there protections in place or are there like procedures so that um, before the building process, there are like inspections? Obviously, things are going to come up as you like dig into the earth. You can't like completely. Sure. Yeah, but um like what kind of processes are in place in development projects to prevent unearthing human remains or artifacts? Well, the answer to that is yes, no, and sort of. Okay. <laughs> so in some areas you have both federal and state regulations require people to do research, uh, which is why we have as many cultural research management firms here in South Carolina as we do, and the Council for South Carolina Professional Archaeology, which is made up of many of these people who do that work. So, you know, Section 106, uh, OCRM, uh, you know, the Historic Preservation Act, uh, the Environmental Protection Act. You know, when these things apply, yeah, there's, there's research that's done. Uh, when these things don't apply, sometimes there's this, the research is done. Mm -hmm. Whether the research is done because of regulation or not, the violation of sepulcher under state law is a, is a felony. Now, let's be very clear. I'm a state archaeologist. I am not an attorney. I do not play an attorney on TV. Okay, you want to talk, you know, law. You have to go find an attorney and/or the uh, you know state's attorney general's office and get an opinion. But generally speaking, from you know my experience, when people have a chance find, in other words, they don't intentionally go through the middle of a cemetery. Hopefully, they then do the right thing, and we go back into the other conversations we just had. If somebody knows or has reason to know that there is a cemetery on the land and they do not check and they go through an area and, and bones of individuals are then popped up. That becomes a law enforcement and a prosecutorial statement. Uh, I am that law enforcement and I don't prosecute anybody, you know, except for my cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> so that type of thing is outside of the direct purview of the office. Now saying that, Back in 1998, when I first uh, received the funding for my geophysics equipment, the understanding that was made clear, it was a bipartisan fund by the bipartisan legislature of that time and since when they have helped me upgrade equipment, is that means that I am now seconded uh, as a consulting forensic archaeological recovery specialist to assist state law enforcement at request on recovery of evidence uh, and the rest and dealing with missing persons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes I get pulled into these things from that end, usually in conjunction with the coroner's office and or with an evidence recovery team, sometimes the FBI or others. And uh, most recently uh, with uh, several very good dog groups, uh, cadaver dogs. Mm. Uh, and that becomes again, a separate issue. That becomes recovery statement Again, those people who we find are crime scene one way or the other, they aren't coming back here. Uh, they are in the hands of law enforcement, coroner's office, whatever. And then it moves in a very different direction. And unless I'm called in as an expert witness, uh, pretty much my involvement is done at that point. Okay, so my next question is one about museums, because I know that repatriation is also related to artifacts that have been put into museums acquired by various means. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to potentially talk about that with you um, and sure. talk about how that's related to what you do and also different from what you do. Because I know archaeology is also related to museum work and um, it's just a complicated issue. It is a complicated issue to a point. Right. And there right. are some people who like to make things more complicated than they necessarily have to be. Right. Anything that's associated with the burial, 
is covered by the Native American Great Protection Repatriation Act. And it, actually that law was has partially specified because of the issue of museums, mm. okay? And collections, not simply museums, because there are collections that are not museums. Right, right, right. And yes, um, that, that's a serious issue. There are any number, I mean, you can talk to any number of people who are you know, ceramicists in the state, uh, archeologists who are dealing with questions of pottery and the rest. Uh, who will tell you that there are some forms of pottery that are distinctly involved with inhumations, burials, mm. okay? Whether you find bones in them or not. And not infrequently, depending on the time period, they may have been cremains, which means that the person finding them may not have recognized it was a burial. Those things are covered. Uh, they're burials under state law. Again, the state law doesn't care the age of the burial. It's covered. Uh, when museums hold on to these things, they have a liability. And most of the museums I've been in contact with in South Carolina, the big ones anyway, um, have been very clear on this and very proactive uh, in terms of inventorying, uh, complying with the federal law, uh, having conversations and the rest. Uh, so that's the good news. Unfortunate news is that there's, you know, that things got collected. <laughs> Yeah. What can you right. do? I mean, it's not like they didn't happen. It, they did. And there have been repatriations. Uh, one that's been was done with Fish and Wildlife was uh, Santee out of the Santee Mounds. Uh, and that was a whole slew of materials, including uh, some, you know, very important pottery. And part of the problem here is, from my point of view, and I think from the point of view of many, but not all, by any stretch of the imagination, you know, academics, the, the question of, you know, artwork and the rest going back is, well, you know, it's part of the burial. Uh, it's right. not your patrimony, it's theirs. Uh, it was meant to be with the deceased and there's a law involved and there are ethics that are involved. I know the big E word, ethics. Um, and we try to adhere to the ethics. There are other individuals who are involved in it commercially who, as is not uncommonly the case in other circumstances, if you have a buttress of two or three purchases between the initial person who found it, quote unquote, and the uh, person who uh, ended up with it, then it's clean to be sold. So the Hopi, for instance, uh, which is a case uh, in France, uh, had a serious issue with the uh, sale of some of their religious materials, you know, and they could not get them back. And there was no question about them being looted uh, from uh, ritual areas on the Hopi reservation. No question, you know, no question. But they were not sufficiently protected underneath US law, which never signed on to the international law, which they helped write uh, in France. So they're, it, you know, they're lost, which is horrific. Right. Uh, so then so there, there are, are these you, like, then there are these like important objects that are just all over the world, but Sure. belong yeah belong to these communities yeah i mean you know people people understand when you say looted egyptian or taken sold egyptian antiquities uh they understand when you start talking about friezes being knocked off of anger Wat, right mm -hmm. uh they understand when the bambian buddhas got blown up in afghanistan uh but they tend not to understand or not to make the connection at least immediately sometimes they do a little bit later that it's happening here mm. and that becomes an issue. So some of the museums are holding on materials they may not know that they're holding on to because they haven't been identified properly. Most of the ones I've dealt with have gone out of the way to make sure exactly what they were doing, you know, knowing what they're holding on to. Taking things off of exhibit because they're not appropriate for exhibit at that point mm. and working their own way through the process. Now each museum has its own governing board and the rest. I am not in charge of the museums in the state. And they handle it on their own. And sometimes they reach out and we have conversation and not infrequently if it's something specialist. Uh, again, because we do have a tremendous uh, depth of knowledge within the archeological community here in South Carolina. Uh, I'll drag in other members of uh, the community who have the specifics they really need. And then we, you know, we take it from there, or I should say we provide and they take it from there. Yeah, so yeah, museums are important. Underneath the current circumstances of the pandemic, it's going to become even more important because museums, big and small, are failing 
left and right. Mm -hmm. Most museums survive on a shoestring between donors and the public paying as they come through the door. So if there's no public. They lose and right. then they close their door. And then the question becomes what happens to their collection? What are, what's the paperwork that's in place? Uh, my concern is as things fail, materials which were not legally obtained, but have become legal through the process of passing hands becomes part of the marketplace. They become and, part of the marketplace? Like they're auctioned? Yeah, sure. eBay, oh my. Etsy, uh, other specific uh, Facebook groups. There's a huge multi-million dollar business in South Carolina on artifacts. So these things become part of the marketplace and then that becomes an issue for all communities. Yeah. Uh, but because of the specific interest in anything Native American uh, of real concern for the Native American community. And that's, that is a, that keeps me up nights. That is not a happy thought. No. Not at all. I, I didn't realize that museums would like auction artifacts off b before they repatriated them. Well, um, I, it depends on what they, it depends, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it you're depends, good. It depends on, on how they put together their paperwork. Uh, most museums generally don't have a statement that says, thank you for your donation. If we go toes up, uh, we'll send it back to you. I see. And in those instances where it's been taken from a community without the community's consent and become part and parcel of someone else's collection, they're not even, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't necessarily even know who to go back to. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is like, did they return it to, would they return it to the donor or would they like do research and try to return it to the community? But then that's difficult. Yeah. None of the above. One of the things <sighs> that uh, the, uh, that the um, public law one did do, the, the act, the Repatriation Act, it, is that it put into play a process where things are listed uh, prior to repatriation as part of the discussion of repatriation in the Federal Register. So groups that are interested, concerned, you know, the 500 plus groups here in the United States that are fairly recognized, and then of course all the state recognized, et cetera, et cetera, have a place to go to to check. But if you're not following that regulation because you don't come under that regulation, you're a small mom and pop museum, you've never taken federal funds, right? You didn't collect them yourself, they were donated to you, there you are. Yeah, I remember um, my family went to South Dakota a couple years ago and there were a lot of much smaller like independent museums out there and a lot of them did have Native American artifacts. Sure. Um, and so I guess those would be examples of that where they're not monitored, like they're not, you know, listed under, um, under that because they're not, they don't receive federal funds. Now they, now it's not infrequently the case for groups that have gone for a charitable uh, designation, a 5013C or something to have, again, an end of days statement that the materials from them will be taken over by a larger entity. In other words, they're absorbed by a state museum or a regional or something of that nature. Uh, that the that the uh, the uh, material resources collections of that group don't simply fly into the air. But that's that's an individual statement by an individual group based on their individual situation, context, board of directors if they have one, community standards, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that could be pretty exciting. And unfortunately, again, because of the pandemic, because of people not going out for good reasons, by the way, especially, especially in the Native American community. Yes. Which yes. is in the crosshairs of this virus. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're going to see more of this and it's going to be interesting to see how we can mitigate it as much as we possibly can. I remember finding out about the like artifact black market like a year or so ago and yeah it's kind of a terrifying thought so rather than end this interview on <laughs> kind of a depressing <laughs> note let's kind of try to look look positively to the future sure um, 
what can people do to support Native American or African American communities who are trying to have ancestors' remains or artifacts repatriated? Well, uh, there are a couple things that one can do. One, one thing we could do is to not engage in uh, activities or support activities or permit activities around you that would uh, cause uh, damage to those groups. So right. if you have friends who are engaging in illegal acts, tell them to stop. In terms of specific repatriation in this state, part of our problem, of course, is the pandemic. We're actually further along on that than we've ever been before, uh, which is great because I made a promise and I'll put it here out, out front that I was going to try to get this done before I ended up on the shelves myself. Part of that situation is going to be funding from the feds and the rest to assist in the final push, uh, the preparation for the areas to be for the reburial assistance to the groups that are specifically involved with that aspect of it. If it gets to the point where we are asking the state for assistance, which is possible, then we would hope that, uh, you know, I can't lobby. I work for right. the state. Neither, neither can we. <laughs> right. Private citizens, on the other hand, can say, well, if we get to that point, and, you know, and it becomes aware that it's in front of, of the legislature, to call their legislator at that time and suggest that this is an appropriate thing to do. I mean, nobody wants to see their grandmother or grandfather on a shelf. Yeah. It's not where they belong. Right. Um, and, you know, and they should go back with everything that the family put with them in the first place. Yes. Uh, you know, I think most of us uh, understand that. Uh, there are some people who don't. Yeah, let's be clear. There are some people who really don't understand that. But there are most of us, I think, do. And if we get to that point, then, yeah, I mean, you know, public support is important. Okay. But I can't coordinate it and I'm not going to lobby. That doesn't happen. I feel like often in these discussions, you come away with like, well, what can I do about this? Like, it's such a big, broad issue. What can I do? So I was just trying to, you know, give give ideas. Um, and I, I also think that it sounds like in terms of um, talking about whether or not a collection is like appropriate, it sounds like conversations about appropriation versus appreciation or just like different education Sure. Like seeking further education might be um, a good solution to that. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, I think there are a couple of things that have that muddy the waters on some of these issues and have beset yes. the Native American community in general. Uh, part of it has been, of course, who's an Indian. So yes. you have the groups that were fortunate enough to have federal treaties and they have a federal relationship, uh, sovereign to sovereign between themselves and the federal government. That's groups here in South Carolina, the Catawba are the specific group. Uh, of course, you have the Cherokee up north and North Carolina, other groups in other places. Then because of the question of uh, segregation in South Carolina, you had three different schools. You had, you know, white, colored, and Indian for a period of time. Right. But the majority of those other groups that were Native American recognized by the state at that time did not have federal treaties. Right. Uh, if you're a friendly Indian, you might not get a treaty. You know, then what do you do? But again, in the state, uh, as a consensus between the federally recognized Catawba and the Native American communities, uh, which have managed to survive to this point in time and continue to thrive, or at least survive, thrive might be a hard word, uh, then you end up with the, uh, with the state recognized. And of course, since you're at the Commission of Minority Affairs, you know all about that because you have the page listed. What right. that also means is that people who pop up like mushrooms on a Thursday morning and decide they're Native Americans are not helping. If they actually have a genealogy which points to them having that background, then they should probably be in contact directly, not through this office, and really not through your office either, I would, would not suspect, uh, with the Native American entities that have been recognized in the area and see if they are part or parcel of their groups. Right. But having people self-identify as such without the background on what are actually fairly tough legal, and again, I'm not an attorney, legal issues uh, makes it more difficult for the communities themselves to actually gain a point in time 
where they have succeeded in repatriation. So what else can I help you with? I think that's about it. I mean, we, we have talked, uh, I think we've covered easily the basics um, and I've really appreciated what insight you can give um, into specifically repatriation in South Carolina. That's very cool. So uh, thank you so much for your time and for agreeing to do this with me. And yeah, this has been great. I want to thank Dr. Leader so much for taking the time to meet with me. He did such a wonderful job of walking me through repatriation and giving great insight into what repatriation looks like in South Carolina. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, stay tuned for more episodes written, created, and produced by CMA staff. In the meantime, check out our website at www.cma.sc.gov or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.